environment. <coughs> The priest in town would go away every November. And after I got to know the priest in town, who for me at that age, he seemed really old. So I'm thinking 60, right? <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> no, but I mean, like, because I was, I don't know, my late 30s. And so he seemed old. But him and his sister, who was a nun, went to Fort Benning, Georgia to the School of the Americas and protested every year. Every year of his life, he went to Fort Benning, Georgia to the School of Americas and protested. And you're like, what is the School of the Americas, right? Because did they teach you that in school? Well, you would be too young to maybe have learned about it <laughs> or too old, depending on your age. Um, when we decided that we were going to be in control of Central and Latin America and South America, we set up this school that would train people in how to be the perfect dictator and train their soldiers in how to control the people so they could be the perfect di dictator. So they taught people crowd control, they taught people torture, they taught people how to use weapons, and then they went into all those different countries. Sometimes our soldiers went with them to help them to make sure that the overthrow of the government happened in the way we wanted it to go. And it came to a head in the late 80s when they killed six nuns. And that's when the Catholic Church started writing the names of all the people killed in Honduras and Colombia and Nicaragua and bringing them to Fort Benning and placing those crosses into the wire that surrounded the School of Americas. So we decided to close it down. Yay, we did the right thing. We voted, we shut it down, the School of the Americas. And then a year later, lo and behold, it opened up with a new name that sound, made it sound so much better like they weren't training people to take over other governments and hurt people. And so every year, this priest from Wyoming went to Fort Benning and to the School of Americas and protested. He took up his cross and followed Jesus to a site that led to other people's oppression and pain. So lately, those protests have moved. They still happen in Fort Benning, but they have also moved to the southern border because it turns out that they decided that that would be a good place to train ICE agents at this new School of the Americas. So I want you to think about that. They're training ICE agents in the place they taught dictators how to overthrow government. They taught soldiers how to hurt the population around them, creating authoritarian governments. That's where our ICE agents, some of them, are being trained and deployed. So recently, some of those School of America protests have moved then to the southern border to protest the same people that are still being hurt by the actions that are trying to come north from Honduras and Colombia and Nicaragua. Take up your cross and follow me. What does that mean to you? Because I was searching the internet trying to find pictures of this, right? People carrying crosses. And do you know that most of the images are from Good Friday? Not the ones I'm showing right now, but the rest of the ones that you'll see are from Good Friday. Um, there are many traditions in different cultures to carry the cross, or to have people carry the three crosses through town to be placed symbolically somewhere on the church ground, or to be carried right into a sanctuary at the beginning of a worship service. But is that what Jesus is talking about? What did he mean when he said, take up your cross? 
follow me? And in order to get to that question, I think we have to get to the first part of the scripture, right? Which was, who do you say I am? Because how you take up your cross and follow Jesus depends on who do you say Jesus is. How do you answer that question? What does it mean to you when you talk about Jesus? How do you describe who Jesus is? And that description then carries into what it means to take up your cross. So if you believe that the purpose and point of Jesus' ministry on earth was to be the redeeming Savior who makes it so we all have eternal life, which is the predominant Christian image. But we're in UCC, which means we answer the question, who do you say I am, in a whole variety of ways. Some of us answer it that way. But what does that look like for your cross that you're carrying? If the only important part about Jesus is that you get eternal life. Is that if you can convince people the right question, they too can get eternal life. How you answer that question changes how you carry your cross. Because if you answer that Jesus is a prophet, a person who confronts authority, who challenges the status quo, who brings the kingdom of God, does that change how you carry your cross? Does it change where you're going to take up your cross and follow Jesus? Does it mean you're going to go to places that are very different than you expected? Does it mean you're going to enter into relationships with people that you haven't taken up relationships with? Does it mean that when you look at the world, you look through the eyes of what we've seen that Jesus does, right? In this sermon series on being open, what did we see Jesus doing when bringing the kingdom of God? He healed people. He fed people. He taught in synagogues. He questioned authority and challenged tradition. If you use any of those descriptors for who Jesus is, and you follow, where does that take you? How does it transform what you think about how you're to be as a Christian? When I was doing my ecclesiastical council, so you know they all grill you about your paper that you wrote, and I'm mostly a very passionate, upbeat person, right? And so the one question that the guy raised his hand, the pastor, looked at me and said, but how are you going to take up your cross and follow? He was trying to get to me that taking up my cross It's going to be hard. It's going to be dangerous. It's going to put me into conflict with people. It's going to mean that there are people that aren't going to like me or the words that come out of my mouth. It means that there are going to be real struggles and challenges. Now, I don't think I gave him a very good answer, but it was good enough that he voted for me anyway. Because it wasn't something that I thought about or struggled with, partly because when you're a brand new 
excited to be pastor, pastor? You haven't done anything yet, right? So you don't know what those words mean. And I don't know that I have a good answer still today about taking up my cross. Because part of the reason I took so long to become a pastor was because I didn't want to give up stuff. I didn't want to give up the ability to buy a new car. I didn't want to give up the ability to own my own home. I didn't want to be paid at a rate that is worse than everybody else that has my same educational background. I said no, and no, and no, and no, because I wasn't willing to pick up a cross. Because I thought that the material stuff of life was more important. And that's why when Jesus talks about this, he talks about how at a certain point, when you take up that cross, some of that stuff falls away and isn't as important. You learn ways around. You decide what is important and what is necessary and how to follow in a way that's true and real. And how to follow in a way that, like Jesus, puts people on edge makes them a little uncomfortable because he wants you to see the kingdom coming now. And in the kingdom coming now, it means we all have to change. If we want everybody to have healing, then we have to give up something <coughs> so that everybody can have the same. If we want everybody to have the potential to grow into wholeness, then we may have to give up a little bit of what we have so that woman in Ghana has enough food to feed her child. And so when we ask that question, who is Jesus, and answer it, and take up our crosses, we are putting ourselves into a world that invites us to be different and act different and call other people to be and act differently. That's why I put those pictures from Fort Benning there. Because I know some of you have shrugged every time I've gone to a protest, although lately I haven't done that because I was afraid of COVID. But for me, it's taking up your cross. It's saying to the world that here are the things that Jesus told me were important. And here are the things that I need to do to help bring about that transformation. And when pastors speak out and stand up, they're saying to you, look at this a little bit more closely. Look at this and see where you see the things that are holy, the things that are of God and the things that aren't. why it isn't always easy to be a Christian. Because our crosses aren't a burden that weighs us down. There's something that invited us into a creating, helping to bring forth the God love in the world. Bring out the flavors and colors of God that are different than the way we see the world normally. That challenge those easy assumptions that we make. That challenge our comfort. So who do you say I am? Redeemer, savior, prophet, rabbi, teacher, friend, healer, When you answer that question, when you know who Jesus is, then he invites you to take
take up your cross and follow.